teams have touched down in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin, Road America, and have taken their first few practice laps for the weekend in an effort to develop the perfect setup to defeat this supersonic course. And we, the Formula Forza crew, would like to welcome you along with us for the pre-race podcast for this week's Grand Prix of the Americas. It's the Formula Forza pre-race podcast by Jet Motorsport. I'm your host, Brad James, Gamertag Winner J. And I'm Ryan McDowell, Gamertag Siphon68. And I am Derek James, Gamertag Magnum278. So this week, we've brought along with us a special guest. Care to introduce yourself? Hello, and I am Steven Hudek, Gamertag XPR Roadrunner, Team Principal, and Driver for Serpent Racing. We know why you came here. You came here for the Motega GP results and for the look ahead to Road America. But first, let's dive right into that Motegi GP and take a look at qualifying. Sometimes we have qualifying that is, you know, extremely close, and other times we have just a blowout, you know, at the front. And this is one of those times. We had two guys, the Bull and Wall 5 and in Flames, that were just head and shoulders above the rest of the field. Pole last year was a 139.3 uh, around this 14-turn circuit, and... Man, the the top six uh, all managed to. Well, I guess the top five managed to beat it, and the we had three more after that that were all within a tenth of beating that. Uh, so you're looking at the Bullen Wall and Flames, Alex P, XPR Roadrunner, and BTR Blazon, all under that 139.3 mark. However, uh, Alex P in third with a 138.9 is nine tenths behind second place in flames at a 138.0. Then you have the Bullen Wall 5 went even faster, the only driver to dip into the 137s with a 137.925. Just lightning quick from those two guys. And it was it was just really impressive to see that exchange of times happen. Um, you know, the, the action as it, as it was forming was just really exciting to see uh, develop. Now the rest of the field was surprisingly close. Uh, we had about 20 drivers that were all within about two seconds of each other, uh, and that that goes from uh, the middle of Group A through the middle of Group B, and you know that's always good to see that we have a lot of really close uh, drivers. Like for example, Bloody Kane and. Uh, RUK Shadow from AVR, they were only five thousandths of a second away from each other. BTR Snakey and BTR Kanan were only uh, four thousandths of a second away from each other. I mean that 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 stuff is just you know immense to see that happen. Um, it, you know there were there were others as well like uh, Derek. You were you know just a, a few thousandths ahead of uh, Goddess at the at the back of of Group A there. But still, I mean, we're talking thousands of a second, not hundreds of a second, thousands of a second. Um, so seeing that develop, it was a pretty good battle for uh, getting into Group A as well. We see BTR Raikkonen have his best qualifying performance of the season. Nearly getting into Group A got pushed out by less than a tenth uh, to be pole for Group B. When a J, master of, of practice during the qualifying session, ended up... Uh, B2. How do, you, how do you feel about that, Brad? Can I decline? <laughs> you were still only two hundredths away from the pole sitter in Group B, BTR Raikkonen, so still a strong performance, but I think given more practice time, you could have even been into Group A. Who knows? Yeah, I could but have. But as it, as it stands, it was a, it was, you know, a pretty good mix of, of drivers in each, uh, in each lobby there. One thing we did see was the return of Rising Sun Racing into Group A. Bloody Kane was able to take the Lola chassis and put it a 12th. So that's that's great stuff. Um, we are starting to see some, not strategy in qualifying, but we, we are starting to see some, uh, some interesting ways people are qualifying. Like we're seeing a some of the regulars come in on the first day of qualifying and lay down some times. This time, uh, for the Bullen Wall at least, there was almost no strategy. He laid down his ridiculous lap pretty much on day one, uh, and then it just sat there while In Flames tried to get faster and faster, and he ended up closing up to, you know, roughly uh, a tenth and a half or so. 
but uh, just couldn't get under the 137 mark, or well, I guess under the 138 mark. But it was still a really impressive uh, qualifying period. We did have no dropouts this week, which was pretty interesting. 30 total qualifiers. And even at the back, there wasn't that huge gap that there there normally is. WRC Cape perhaps put in uh, the practice he really needed and really was not that far to, say, B13, B14, Fire Dragon, and Fish from JRM Racing. So uh, props to WRC Cape for for uh, sticking in there and, and getting close to moving up from, from what he's used to there. Uh, normally in the drop zone in this season, was able to get into Group B, so that's that's good stuff for him. Uh, the other one that was that was pretty interesting was TLR Eclipse, usually a Group A qualifier this week, B3. That's not, not a, uh, you know, a, a disappointment really, it just shows that this track can be more challenging than others for certain cars. Um, certainly the, the Ferraris uh, showed that they had some strength here. XPR Roadrunner qualifying fourth, even with a 5% power restriction. Alex P, same thing, 5% power restriction, A3 in that Panos. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was certainly a, uh, an interesting unfolding of how this qualifying came out. When it came time for the race, however, strategy really did come into play and during the race, we had um, we had Bulin leading the race uh, for a good majority of it, and then decided to come in for his pit. And that's when you saw In Flames go to the front, and really from there never left the lead. Uh, you did see BTR Blazin right on the heels of uh, Alex P from Aces Wild. Uh, BTR Blazin in third, Alex P in second. And you saw BTR Blazin try and close that gap to Alex P, but even with that power restriction, really couldn't make the difference there, couldn't uh, make it happen. Alex P did go off, uh, and that allowed BTR Blazin to get by him, and then Alex P decided to go ahead and do his, his pit stop. In the end, it looked like the Bullen Wall was going was gonna to come forth no matter what. When he came out of the pits, he did get into... Um, he didn't get. He did get into fourth place, and then just stayed there. And it looked like he was gonna, you know, as as the pits filtered out, it looks like he was gonna regain the lead until he decided to pit again. It's a really interesting move from Pennzoil's Axel, but really not all that shocking considering that the next race is the American GP. So, you know, you gotta you gotta figure a power track coming up, maybe one of the last ones until we get to the season finale at Le Mans. Uh, do you really want to win that race? You know, do you want 10% restriction at a track that is certainly not a grip track? It, it's certainly a top speed track. Um, and the the answer from the front runners was a resounding no. You saw the Bullen Wall 5 finish fourth, exactly where he would want to finish. Alex P coming in right behind him in fifth to ensure that he drops back down to 0% power restriction. And then XPR Roadrunner uh, coming in in sixth. Not sure how much of that was strategy, and, and I'm sure Stephen can fill us in on that in, in just a moment, but uh, that sixth place finish for XPR Roadrunner, I'm sure he would have liked more points, maybe fourth or fifth, but uh, for sure didn't want to land on podium to acquire even more power restriction. So that meant that this race, we have In Flames, who already had used his immunity, finished uh, with his first victory for both himself and Boshtek Racing, a, a great accomplishment for them. And during the race, even though he was unable to get in the 137s in qualifying, during the race he was able to pull off a 137-788. That's just blisteringly quick, and nobody else could uh, could really come close to that. Bullenwall was able to do a 137-975 975 just uh, half a tenth slower than his qualifying pace, but... Uh, I mean, you, you look at that, and in flames was was a full two tenths quicker, and throughout the race, if you watch the the, the full race, you can see that uh, in flames is doing those kind of times pretty regularly, one thirty seven eights, one thirty seven nines, lap after lap after lap. So he really did have legs here, and in the end, just had an immense gap to BTR Blazin in second for Katrim. That is the best points for both BTR Blazin and Katrim R one for the season as well as uh, Johnny Two-Shoes there right in the final lap um, 
was let by by uh, Bullen Wall and Alex P. Surely by strategy uh, to to allow him onto the podium so that they wouldn't fall on the podium. Johnny Two Shoes does pick up uh, the first podium for Midnight Performance Development. A great performance for them in their debut season here with uh, Formula Forza and the R1 Championship. So really, hats off to those guys for for that. Uh, we did have uh, BTR Canaan. He was unable to to join the race. Um, so the the race did run with 14 drivers, no lagouts and no collisions in Group A. So that that's great. No lagouts, no disconnects, no retirements. Group A, uh, fairly clean and and extremely close, especially that last lap. Um, you know, we saw if you if you look at the the official results uh, and they're up on Facebook. If you haven't seen them, you look at at just how close fourth through geez, uh, 12th were, or I guess 11th, and you see that, uh, you know, it's it's a zero-second gap, or, you know, so less than one second, then a one-second gap to Alex P., uh, then a, another one-second gap to XPR Roadrunner, another one-second gap to BTR Villanov, a six-second gap to RUK Shadow, which really is not that far behind. That's like one mistake, and RUK Shadow would have moved up from 8th to 7th. Um, so extremely close racing here from these guys. And even at the back, we're looking at, at Bloody Kane in 13th and Scurry 76 in 14th, one second separating the two of those guys, uh, finishing out Group A. Uh, so really a spectacular race. And if you haven't seen it, it is out there on YouTube. Um, so do take a look. This is a slightly different format on YouTube because we, uh, we, didn't uh, we didn't have the driver comms, so you just hear me commentating the entire race. And from what we've heard, it, it is some uh, positive feedback on they like that method as opposed to the chaos of hearing the uh, the driver comms. So you know, check it out if you haven't already. Uh, but uh, Brad, you want to give us a rundown of what happened in the Group B race? It was awesome. Um, me and uh, BTR Raikkonen straight from the get-go we're up pretty gone i feel like from the rest of the field but other than that there were some great battles throughout the field i mean obviously i'm kind of happy that um my new uh teammate addy addy um finished on the podium which is great for him in his uh, first formula for the race but other than that uh chaos in action had a not so good race as usual um he he, he had a, some uh, terrible luck got in a couple incidents uh, causing him damage and uh, James Hall good race for him coming back at, uh, from injury you know with his hand and everything so it's his uh, um, a decent debut for him and uh, actually El Wombo Combo one of the people we had from uh, Mazda Cup making his debut race in R1 uh, having a good performance moving up four positions and uh, other than that we had TLR Eclipse and Chicken Man Haggard moved down nine positions not so good for them but um it was a good race. Uh, other than that, um, you know, the uh, um, yeah, everybody was weren't quick. There, uh, quick. Yeah, weren't there? Yeah. So, there's a few incidents between a couple of the drivers. Um, I seem to have hey, heard I know. James Hall had an incident with Hundredth Tie that uh, caused some concern. Yeah, um, it's it, it's hard a little. It's hard to to explain, but uh, James, from what it sounded like, got caught in Hundredth's draft. And it sort of rear-ended Hundredth, but um, and Hundredth was really mad at him, and James uh, didn't want to ha have a penalty against him, so he let Hundredth back by, and Hundredth was still mad at him, you know, like, you know, I know James let him by so he could uh, basically Hundredth couldn't penalize him because then he didn't gain any positions for it, and then James did later on pass him later in the race cleanly, so. You can't really penalize him there, so James is really worried about that. So that there's a clarification of, of the rules here, if you are involved in an incident, it's honestly best to just keep driving. I know it sounds like kind of a, um, you know, a, an uncaring or, or unprofessional thing, but let the penalty sort it out. Um, you know, James Hall, it's possible, James Hall only finished four seconds behind Chaos in Action. Had he not stopped... Uh, and let hundredth by uh, from what I heard twice he probably could have got by chaos and action for fifth in group B and and letting somebody by 
only helps if they don't drop any more positions. In the end, James Hall did get that position over 100 tie, so it, it, just handing off the position doesn't mean you're immune to picking up penalty. And in fact, in this instance, um, it was under review for quite a while before uh, Catrum decided to drop the case for for any penalty there. They, they decided to not pursue penalty on, on James Hall. But yeah, it does not save you just just handing back the position. You, I mean, that's you've already affected their race. The the arrow damage is already done. Uh, saying that he passed him later cleanly doesn't mean anything because hundred tie already. I mean, he he still had the damage, so it it wasn't necessarily on merit that he passed him. So uh, continuing on with the uh, the race here. We did have a first corner incident uh, with Fire Dragon, and uh, I believe I was uh, Ferrari Fanatic 9, if, if that's correct. But um, he did um, hit Ferrari Fanatic 9, or it, it, it might have been James Hall, but one of the two got hit, and then the other one hit the other person. Um, you know, like uh, Domino's, uh, Domino effect there. But I, I'm not sure any penalty was uh, pursued. Basically, that's Group B, uh, another great race from the uh, drivers down there. So uh, if we want to uh, move on to uh, the points, Derek. Yes, sir. Um, let, here we go. The top 10 driver championship standings right now. The Boulinwall 5 from Penzo Zexel is sitting pretty atop the standings at number 1 with 415 points, with Alex P. trailing him from Aces Wild with 397. In third place, we have Steven, XPR Roadrunner, with 308. And... In fourth place, BTR Villeneuve, Kyle Litherland, sitting four points back from Roadrunner with 304. Then fifth, we have In Flames from BTR, just his third race of the year, and he's already climbed to fifth in the standings with an 82-point performance in Florida, a 105-point performance at Hockenheim, and a 101-point performance at Motegi. In sixth, we have FMS Senna with 283 points, sitting just five points shy of that fifth place spot and in flames. In seventh, Johnny Two Shoes from Midnight Performance Development, fresh off his podium finish in Motegi with 229 points. In eighth place, we have BTR Blazon from Caterham R1, sitting again five points back from Johnny Two Shoes with 224 points. And then in ninth, you have me. Magnum 278 from Jet AMG, Jet Motorsport, with 194, sitting a bit back from 8th place, but not too far out of reaching distance. And then in 10th, again, with Serpent Racing, we have XPR Overdrive, who missed Motegi, but is still sitting in the top 10 with 188 points. Meanwhile, in the team championship standings, the top 5, we have Penzoil Zexel sitting up top with 630 points, a 101 point lead over Aces Wild Motorsports sitting in second. In third, we have Serpent Racing with 496, sitting about 33 points back from uh, Aces Wild. And then in fourth, we have LLBM R1 with 411 points. And rounding out the top five driver or team championship standings, we have BTR. Again, only have shown up to three races this year and have already accumulated 384 points. So that is an amazing performance by BTR. Steven, before we move on from Motegi, you want to quick give us uh, your thoughts on what happened at Motegi. I know you you had a great seat for those last few laps. And uh, I understand that uh, your your launch monster, your Ferrari, uh, had some good starts, and and sometimes this happens with restarts and things like that. You get you know one that's really good, and you wish we had a, had gone on that or or whatever. Is, is that uh, also the case here at uh, Motegi? Yeah, the um, the first restart that we had, um, I was actually able to get our launch monster alongside um, uh, In Flames for second place, and I actually had him beat. Uh, cleanly going into turn one but then we had an incident uh, sort of in the middle of the field so we had to restart and the uh, the restart sorry the start that we ended up going on I got alongside him but um, he got a better launch versus the other attempts and so I had to uh, concede his uh, racing line because it would have made it like three or four wide wherever it was going to turn one and of course no one wants that um, but uh, then I made a couple of mistakes um, in the uh, corners ahead of that, um, had a slight 
contact with Johnny Two Shoots, which in the race I actually didn't uh, feel it or hear it. Um, I just assumed that uh, my reason why my car got sideways because I was I kind of I think I clipped the dirt on the inside, uh, turn seven, turn eight, where that corner is, and. Um, uh, from then on, I was just keeping uh, BTR Villeneuve uh, behind me the whole race. I remember he went to go pit and uh, or to try to get the clean air. And when he came back out, um, I had already uh, decided to uh, do a couple of laps just so that you know I can get a clear mind because there's no one ahead of me for conceivable distance because uh, Johnny Sushi's had quite a bit of a gap. And uh, when I came back out of the pits after pitting uh, on the same lap, actually, as Bullenwall, because he had passed me the previous lap, uh, Kyle was behind me by some 300 feet, and I remember he was quite uh, disappointed that he couldn't uh, gain that position back. Um, but uh, yeah, that last lap was was very hairy. You saw the Bullenwall and Alex; um, they were in third and fourth um, at the time going into the last lap and they both wanted well Bullen wanted to have Alex go by for for third place but of course Alex didn't want to get the extra penalty so instead he wanted Johnny two shoes uh, to get that third place so you saw Alex P and Bullen wall start backing up through the field similar to what Alex P and I did in the Mazda Cup at uh, Catalonia um, except there was no massive mistake by yours truly <laughs> to get uh, um, pretty much enough damage to get retired, but you saw that field, um, they bunched together quite, uh, quite a bit, and I thought uh, BTR Vilna was going to be able to get around me, but in the end, uh, we all finished quite uh, close to each other. Based on strategy, I had no idea whether uh, In Flames was actually going to accept the uh, the win here, both uh, Bullenwall and Alex P both did double pits here to avoid being on podium, and In Flames could have done just the same thing to fall back to fourth, but really he needed to collect all those points so that he can start to make up some of this gap, and he is aligned fairly well for the rest of the season, uh, you know, whether he intended it that way or not. Uh, he's, he's aligned very well for the rest of the season, although not very well for Road Atlanta, um, but the points where the other guys are going to be restricted, he'll be strong again. So it'll be really interesting to see how that plays out at the end of the season. But, uh, yeah, too bad for XPR Overdrive there. We hope to see him back, and, uh, you know, we, we just start uh, looking quite interestingly at uh, at Sebring and Sonoma for uh, possible podiums for XPR Overdrive there. But who knows? Maybe even it, it can happen here at uh, Road America. But, uh before we get to that, why don't we start talking about uh, LLBM uh, finale and the All-Star Race. Uh, Derek? Yeah, um, this weekend, um, actually, this last Sunday, after the actual, uh, there wasn't the Formula Forza race that weekend, so this closest Sunday, we had, for LLBM, the one hour of Le Mans and the LLBM All-Stars race. First off, with the one hour of Le Mans, uh, how do we put this? Ryan, Brad, and I were not there. We had scheduling conflicts. We couldn't make the race, so the field was a bit short, but not enough to really, you know, uh, put a dent in the action of the race. But Kyle, or uh, sorry, Stephen, I, I apologize, did make the race. But for the qualifying results in the LMP class, the top three were BTR Blazon, In Flames, and BTR Villeneuve. All in the Acura ARX-02A. Um, Blazon actually outqualified in flames, which is astounding, to say the least. That's very impressive. I don't know how much effort Blazon put into it, but he must have drove his heart out to get that time. He outqualified in flames by nearly a second, and that is quite impressive. He ate his Wheaties. Yeah, he did eat his Wheaties. Um, in GT... The top three, we had Nebraska 805, our UK Shadow from Vodafone Racing UK, and XPR Roadrunner Kyle for Super... Or, uh, Kyle, God, there I go again. Steven, I apologize for Serpent Racing. Uh, the top two were within four-tenths of each other, with Nebraska setting a 352.541, and Shadow setting a 352.880. 
Roadrunner fell short by about two seconds at a 354, 672. I believe it's probably due to the fact that the gigantic restrictor that they run on that Viper in real life and in LLBM to because they run over the engine limit for the Lamas series, so the FIA has got to be all, oh, you can't do that. So they restrict the motor a lot to make it even worse than the rest of its competition. In LMPC, Ryan, actually, who set a qualifying time with a 5% race restriction, set a time of 343.769 with Fractal following him at a 346.041. In third place, also for Clone Racing along with Fractal, we had the Cookie Monster, the Jet Interim Driver and Honorary Member of Jet Motorsport, set a 346.320. And finally, in GTC, we had the Bull and Wall 5, I say it every week, but of course, for Flying Wizard Racing, setting a 403.944 with TLR Eclipse and BTR Rent Sport following close behind. <clears throat> the results, actually, we don't have them. The results are not up on the website. They haven't been updated since Sunday, so I, since we weren't there, we don't know the actual winners of certain classes, but Stephen might for the LMP Lobby and the GT Lobby. Steven, do you care to uh, enlighten us on the happenings of the LMP GT Lobby? Um, I believe um, Kyle has posted the winners from each class. I think the winner in LMP was um, BTR Blazon in GT. I believe it was RUK Shadow. Um, I was in the race. I qualified third in the uh, SRT Motorsports uh, sanctioned Viper. Um, like you said before, the uh, restricted that they have it on real life is quite a hindrance at the power tracks. Um, even though I knew that this was long ago, I had signed up for just this one race because I have scheduling conflicts for all the other races. But I decided to use this as a test session for uh, an upcoming race in the in the summer, and um, I was actually pleased with my qualifying results and I learned a lot from it. But during the race. Um, you saw BTR Blazin, um, he pretty much went from the get-go. He was actually able to keep in flames behind him, if I, if I could recall correctly. Um, in GT, um, there was quite a bit going on <laughs> in the middle field uh, on that first lap. BTR Raikkonen was also in that race. He retired quite early um, from damage. I think it was from the first lap incident. Um, but uh, it was a fairly entertaining race um, in GT. There was a good battle between REK Shadow and Nebraska um, for quite a while until the pit stops uh, came into effect. And I think REK Shadow made good on it and he was able to drive away. And I think it was sort of the same issue, or not issue, same sort of happening in LMP. But um, I left the lobby at around the 29th minute or so, so I wasn't able to stay around for the uh, the conclusion of the race. But I think that's pretty much how it went. So, All right. Thank you, Stephen. Brad, the all-star race, what did it entail? You know what, I, I got this one. So LBM, what they did is is it's a multi-class race. So they uh, they took, they have four classes that they run, and we've, we've been discussing them throughout the, the various podcasts that we've had. They have LMP uh, and GT that run together, and then they have LMPC and GTC. So with the four classes, uh, with as much competition as they have, they can't run all four of those in a single race. So they break it up into two lobbies, like I said, LMP and GT together, LMPC and GTC together in a challenge lobby. Um, what the, the idea was is to get all of the guys uh, together. So they take the top four from each class and put them together into a, an all-star race. But with it being multi-class, how do you balance the field so that, you know, it's kind of a level playing field and nobody has an advantage over the other? So what they did is they took kind of a, a middle ground and chose a car that nobody likes, <laughs> the Radical, and made it, forced it stock. Uh, yeah. I love that thing. It's like, no. it's like my second child. <laughs> nobody liked it. <laughs> Tier. So anyway, everybody was on solid ground because Steven wasn't in there. So everybody <laughs> hated the car that was in it. 
So it, it was a qualified race, but what they did, rather than the, the normal Formula Forza slash LBM uh, qualifying format where it's, a, it's an open qualifying, they did a timed uh, live event where it was 15 minutes. Well, Le Mans in these radicals is somewhere near a four-minute lap. It's, it's under that, but uh, just barely. So it, you're looking at only a couple laps are really going to count. And, you know, uncertified laps uh, count below all certified laps. Uh, so that meant it, the collisions were off, we ran for 15 minutes, and those that got clean laps started way at the front. Um, and I, I still think it was, it was fairly predictable. Uh, the slowest class in, in uh, the Le Mans series, GTC, houses uh, the Bull and Wall which was predictably the fastest guy in the all-star race and like clockwork he uh he was able to manage pole in the qualifying session and then went ahead to uh to ultimately to win the race but uh yeah it was it was a it was a crazy session i'm glad we did it but i'm not really <laughs> i'm not really looking forward to any kind of season of all radicals or anything like that uh it was it was pretty intense to say the least that a lot of people you heard during qualifying, oh God, I'm on my roof. <laughs> you know, it was it was pretty hilarious, actually. Uh, it didn't seem very serious. It, in the stock yeah. tunes. Yeah. It was for fun, though. It wasn't like, oh, yeah. It, it, it was supposed to be for the All-Stars, but to me it was. Yeah, it but seemed a little more for fun. Bullen still ran away with it. That didn't stop him. This doesn't mean no. he's not having fun, Derek. I still think it was a fun race. I mean, it, because there was nothing on the line for it, you didn't pay any buy-in for it. it. It meant that even if you did wreck out <coughs> Brad, that it really <laughs> didn't matter a whole lot. Okay, because, let me explain uh, myself. Because it, All right, so I was going into Arnage, you know, very slow corner, on first lap so the tires are cold because it's a stupid radical, and the brakes weren't warm because it's a stupid radical. Because it's a stupid radical. And um, basically, I was going and following uh, Midland Zeta. And literally, he I locked him up a little bit. But I, I managed to uh, recover. But I hit the back of him uh, hit from behind. Don't laugh. You um, recovered right into his rear bumper, then. Yes, yes. But no, we're cut, <laughs> shut up. Let me continue. Let me continue. Um, I hit him going like, it, it was like 15 miles an hour. I hit him from behind. And it gave me a hundred percent everything. I was so I was beyond pissed. I was like, "How does that even happen?" Because I remember watching later on the race that Derek basically hits the wall going like hundred miles an hour, and he gets like ten percent for on the front. And I got a hundred percent everything because it's like a stupid twenty radical. miles an hour. Yes, that and that's why I was pissed. And it, and uh, I ended up racing so bad that I got fired. Apparently. According yeah, we've, we've both been <laughs> sacked. Uh, according to the Jet Motorsport hierarchy, we've both been sacked. We still have not figured out who hit me in that first corner. It wasn't me, so quit blaming me. I saw it in my rear view. It was pretty chaos. I mean, you saw somebody, like, flip over right off the get-go, so I'm not entirely sure who that was. But Good it highlight was, reel, it though. looked insane behind me. Oh, yeah, I'll yeah. Admit. yeah. So, anyway, we, we can... The the All Star race was all in good fun, honestly, and it didn't really count for anything. It was just kind of a hey, let's get the the top guys together and have one last hurrah before the finale. And it was a, it was a good de stressor, I think. Like like they said, it felt very casual, and it was casual, you know. And it, I think that's that's what gave it fun. I think a uh, a demolition derby would have been more productive. <laughs> it was I a will. demolition derby. What are you talking about? Oh, I think uh, <laughs> half the field half the field didn't yeah, that, set a clean lap during qualifying. No, I I did. Ryan didn't. <laughs> At least I did. so that's I a testament a to how sucky that car is. Oh, oh okay then, Mr. Uh, Mr. Perfect. No, Panther. right. It's because Ryan you know, wasn't using the same paint job as you know everybody what? else. You guys yeah. you guys can both crash into a wall. Okay, so <laughs> let's let's go ahead and move along from LBM All Stars because that was just kind of a fun race. Um so uh, Brad, you wanna you wanna take over for our next segment here? Yes, the next segment, as usual, is the videos of the week. And my video of the week is, um, as I understand, it was a Super Bowl commercial. Do you, was it, guys? Do you know? Yeah, it was a Super Bowl commercial. They kind of had it before it was, the Super Bowl, but it, it was aired during the Super Bowl. I didn't watch the Super Bowl, so I didn't know. I didn't see it until this week, so I kind of felt I had to show it or something. But um, 
it's it's the GoPro video of the uh, you know baby little Charlie Ray there. You know the the one where it's like dubstep playing while he's flying through the air. But that's the part everybody talks about. The part everybody doesn't talk about is the vehicle in which he's driving. Oh, it's so cool. It's this little like you know walk thing that teaches the kid how to walk. But if you look at it, it's like two centimeters off the ground. It's slammed. slammed. It's got double wish. It's got double wishbone suspension. He's got all the telemetry on there. Like his steering wheel's like half cut out, and it's got the the shift lights on the top, and all these he's got nice knuckle cut gadgets out. on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's a Formula One car for little kids, and you could tell that he's he's got the uh, the uh, super soft tires on it. You know, for the uh, set the best possible qualifying lap. So he's got the Kimi Räikkönen and eyebrow camera. going. Yeah, 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 yeah. He did show up just like Kimi Räikkönen in like ten seconds before the video. So. You know it, the usual, and then you get to see him flying through the air, and uh, everybody thinks that's it's uh, a, f- a spoon in his hand. It's actually the key fob for his gnarly uh, his gnarly vehicle he's got there. So uh, props to Charlie Ray for having the coolest little kid car ever. I'm definitely envious of him. Um, to you, Derek, for your video. Uh, my video of the week was well. The title says it all: Lamborghini World Rallycross. All it is is a guy beating the ever-living crap out of a Gallardo on a rally special stage. It's like that Enzo video. You're a Ferrari guy. Shouldn't you be enjoying it? I should, but I'm still pissed. It was still an expensive car. Yeah, but who doesn't like to see Lamborghini rallying? As much as I am a car purist, as much as that's like taboo to be like oh no you took a Lamborghini off road the the method at which he does it makes me happy that he did it he didn't take it over any jumps or anything but you get some awesome shots of him getting very sideways on a muddy gravel road and going through many many potholes trying as hard as he can to damage the front splitter and all of those precious 21 inch wheels but it's only like a minute 50 seconds long and all it is is engine noise and in car and on board and shots from inside the forest of this Lamborghini just tearing crap up I don't know where it was shot at it says who the driver was I don't even remember his name but we will all remember his face as that one guy that rallied a Lamborghini alright so now I'm going to uh, interview our special guest this week XPR Roadrunner what turned you on to Formula 4, so how did you uh, end up joining? Magnum 278. Um, uh, no, more <laughs> like <laughs> more like my uh, current teammate, XPR Overdrive, and uh, James Hall, 94. Um, I remember I met XPR Overdrive in a random public lobby once, and, um, and we ended up uh, becoming friends. Um, and uh, I did his um, Codemasters F1 2011 League, which I eventually took over because <laughs> uh, Overdrive uh, unfortunately had other things uh, to do. Um, but uh, that was a bunch. That was a hoot. And then James approached me about um, teaming up for the R1 2012 season. And <clears throat> by that time, it was I think five um, five events left in the calendar, and we were kind of like, hmm. Well, it's such a steep buy-in for what, uh, for like just for the remaining events that were. But then, um, uh, XP Overdrive came in. And he's like, you know what? I'll sponsor you guys. Don't worry about it. Just do your thing. And so, um, at the time, uh, our team was uh, Commonwealth Motorsport, um, which was founded by James and myself because he's British and I'm Canadian. So it was kind of that fitting theme and we ended up using uh, an Aston which is of course um, from England or based in England and we don't care who who technically owns them Shh. Um, the Indians but uh, we used <laughs> yeah ex- yeah well technically they're part of the Commonwealth too so you know it, it still fits but anyways um, oh, okay the um, <laughs> but uh, we ended up using the AMR1 chassis um, because it was fairly new at the time, and we, you know, we, we thought we quite we did quite decent with it. I had um, I don't think I ever was in B lobby when I uh, raced um, at the end of F or sorry uh, R1 2012. Um, I think my best finish was like sixth or seventh at Indianapolis. Um, I pride myself I had the fastest clean lap of that race. So, but um, then we did Mazda Cup. Um, again, James and I hooked up for uh, Mazda Cup, and we brought along Adam Watson, CD195, um, 
and uh, a couple other people that um, well I, uh, well XBR Hato um, who actually is now XBR Mad Dog um, he was supposed to um, drive with us but then he had um, uh, unfortunately uh, scheduling conflict so he ended up didn't racing in Massacre but I mean that's how I kind of got started in, in Formula Forza and uh, just you know talking with uh, staff and I've kind of you know consulted uh, the, or I've been the, sorry I've been doing consulting work for time to time I guess if Ryan wants to uh, use that term <clears throat> um, but uh, you know it's been a, a, a bunch of fun and, uh, and yeah so that's kind of how um, I got started moving on you're on uh, Super Racing right now which is uh, pretty high up in the standings uh, third actually which uh, you're within uh, reaching distance of uh, you could actually get first even though you're about you know you're over 100 points behind but I mean a win's 100 points so right there you could gain that right back theoretically but um what do you think your chances are of uh, the season so far I mean after you're here um going into the season I think Overdrive and I we I think we set our, our, ourselves a goal that we wanted to be in the top five um in the team uh, championship because um, when the draft happened we were I think the fifth or sixth the last team to pick um, and you know the uh, RSR guys Kane and uh, <coughs> Kane and uh, Tacos uh, they um, were a really solid team in 2012 you had Bullen and FMS Senna um, coming out of the blue um, as a team and we knew that they were going to be good and Alex whom I battled uh, really hard with in Mazda Cup um, teamed up with Drake Hellspawn and we knew that they were going to be a solid team if Drake could um, uh, attend the races because that was a problem for him in 2012 so we 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 um, you know it wasn't uh, it's not a totally far out goal and we're sitting third right now which I think is beyond our expectations what we had and um, like uh, Ryan mentioned in a previous podcast that uh, we've it, with the exception of this weekend with Road America and Le Mans we're past all the power tracks and our Ferrari our launch monster um, has uh, injured uh, that uh, sort of period with the power tracks and we're ready to move on to you know Silverstone Sonoma I think I have Sonoma circled on my calendar as the track that uh, I think you'll probably see a really good performance out of either myself or Overdrive um, and Nurburgring as well um, that's a really good track for me as well so we'll who see. would you who would you say is going to be your stiffest competition from here on out in the season you say the power tracks are gone now that you got the grip tracks who is worrying you the most as a team owner um in terms of teams or drivers both, both. let's go with both um <clears throat> well the pencils exoil and and ace as well they can never be counted out um with the rise of the Bosch Tech Racing team, they're also uh, a formidable team that's going to be coming up, but if you were going to ask me whom I'm most concerned about going into the grip tracks, it's definitely going to be uh, AVR with, with Senna. That um, that Mazda, even though it's not a good straight line car, it's, it's relatively better in the corners, so you're going to see um, that uh, come into play. Um, the other teams um, like uh, Rising Sun Racing and um, uh, and Midnight <clears throat> Performance, they're going to be a couple of cars that are going to be really good. Um, the LBM R1 team, uh, Vilnov and uh, Raikkonen, those are going to be uh, some good guys to sort of benchmark. Um, it's a shame that uh, the XBR team has withdrawn because they were a really solid team to sort of get a benchmark on. So I think it's just it's there's no real one team that I think is um, definitely one to look out for in the coming section with the grip tracks. Although if I were gonna pick one driver, definitely in my mind is gonna be Senna. Um, just because his car is more for the grip track 
Um, you saw how well of performance he had at Hockenheim, which is considered a uh, considered a grip track despite that long straightaway. So that's my pick uh, for drivers is definitely FMS Senna. Serpent Racing, do you plan to continue the team in the future? Oh, for sure. Um, with um, with myself now being in extreme performance racing, um, we're going to hope to get um, a team into the uh, development series uh, in the summer. Um, and um, But you'll see a team being called Serpent Racing. It might just be uh, XPR drivers and myself. Um, it'll be interesting to see how many XPR teams that we can actually get um, for the development series and you know on the, the future R1 campaigns 2014 and beyond. It'll definitely be around. Uh, so you are you saying you're going to turn it to Jet Motorsport and have like 15 teams? Uh, maybe not 15, probably like two or three. <laughs> We're seeing that a, a bit more. Uh, XPR, uh, Jet, and uh, BTR. 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 Yeah, Bosch Tech, right, yeah. Exactly. BTR. It'll There's be like 40,000 BTR, BTR people. sponsored teams. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, yeah, that'll be interesting for next season as well. Okay, so we can't, we can't spend a whole ton of time talking about this, but it, it must be mentioned. TeamFormulaForza.com, uh, James Hall approached uh, the Formula Forza administration and requested permission to run an official Formula Forza-backed team in an external series. And he said he would, uh, James Hall said... You know, I'll find the drivers. I, I you know, I swear that we're going to be uh, fine. Uh, you know, very good representation for Formula Forza. You know, I can't guarantee a win, but we will be some of the cleanest drivers out there, and you know, we'll we'll be really good sportsmen about it. And you know, the Formula Forza administration was all over it, so they said, "Yep, yep, go for it. You've got the blessing. You can run a uh, Formula Forza." livery and and go ahead with the the team name and whatnot and he really took it by the 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 horns and uh recruited uh both derek and and uh brad here quote the jet motorsport and, hooligans <laughs> right the jet motorsport hooligans and holy cow what a performance they had uh from starting <laughs> starting really far back i mean they were like third from the back uh in the GTE class. Uh, this is what we're talking about is the Tora 12 hours of Sebring, uh, which is a, it is legitimately a 12 hour race, uh, split up into six, two hour stints, uh, done by each driver. So they do a, a stint and then, uh, you know, one driver will, will represent the team in that stint. And then the next two hours, a different driver could represent the team uh, and how it ended up working out is James Hall did the first uh, six hours. He did the first half for the the team and uh, essentially jumped 13 positions just in his stints. Then uh, you had Brad hop in the, the driver's seat, gained another two positions uh, in class, and then uh, Derek, you hopped back in and gained another four. So holy cow, the car pretty much never went backward and they they in the end overall finished 22nd and that's that is counting the p1 cars ahead of them so 22nd overall they were they moved up 28 positions in class or i'm sorry overall 28 positions overall that is astounding 19 positions in class that's freaking unheard of i mean it's it's really a huge accomplishment for James Hall and the Team Formula Forza guys, uh, you know, I really couldn't have been prouder to to hear those results come in, and James Hall for sure uh, runs a tight ship with that with that crew and and really selected the right guys for that. Uh, we did have some other drivers that were in that uh, that race, notably uh, almost winners, HR Aces Wild, which is essentially just the Aces Wild team from. Uh, the R1 championship and uh, plus the Bullen wall. So it was, the, it was really a stacked deck uh, uh -huh. from the get go. And, and they nearly uh, won the race. If not for a, uh, for a lag out in the fifth stint, that's uh Bullen walls, uh, first stint that he did. Uh, he had a lag out that ended up costing them the race. Uh, they were in the lead. Excuses. 
And, uh, yeah, well, I mean, Obviously, either way, they yeah. finished third overall, uh, third in class also, of course. But uh, it was a really good performance uh, from all involved. Uh, so, like I said, we couldn't be prouder of our TeamFormulaForza.com guys. Um, so, good job, Derek and Brad. Don't I know you guys don't want to, like, pat your own backs or toot your own horns. <laughs> oh, I do it all the time. Do, but Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then we had... So, anyway, uh, keep the school appropriate here. And just to really add real quick, um, there was also another team that was all essentially former Forza drivers. It was uh, the SRT Motorsports car with myself overdrive and uh, Bloody Kane. Uh, unfortunately, we had problems pretty much the whole race, um, so we finished quite down low. But uh, nonetheless, we put on a good show. Actually, you guys there were, were uh, if not mistaken, you guys actually moved up. I, I know you weren't happy with your position, but uh, you guys actually moved up. 10 places overall and three places in class so i don't know that you can really be uh that disappointed with it um steven you you moved up seven positions yourself uh overdrive moved up uh, a total of three positions during his his time in the driver's seat and bloody kane did six hours himself so as you know all things considered uh you know not, you can't really call it a disaster but uh yeah you can always hope for better results next year Anyway, they, they, Team Formula Forza.com started 50th, finished 22nd. That's a great performance from those guys. If you are interested, if you're listening to this podcast and you are interested in running uh, on a Formula Forza uh, team in another championship or would like to run one, uh, please get a hold of either the administration or James Hall, who will, uh, will help orchestrate that. Yeah, Jet Motorsport as well. Uh, you can you can contact those guys and they will surely find you a seat on one of their teams. American GP America predictions, guys. How about you, Ryan? Let's see what you got. Go Canada. Okay, so the 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 American GP at uh, Road America is is always a difficult one to uh, to pin down, but it's not difficult to predict which cars are going to be where. This is a, a unquestionably a speed track the grip cars are going to really struggle here <clears throat> uh, that being said if you go to an extreme case uh, the Acura a uh, ARX 01B does actually quite well here however no teams running the Acura ARX 01B only the O2As so I think they'll do okay here but uh, some of the grippier cars like the Lolas and the um, even the Ferrari may have issues at uh, here at Road Road America. I could be wrong on that, but I'm going to predict that uh, the Panos and the Bentleys are going to be n near untouchable here just because of their, their straight line speed, especially down into turn 12 where they hit their, uh, their top speeds and into turn 1 depending on how quickly they exit turn 14 there. Um, so it, pretty it much really your is, same prediction as always. No, no, I, I'm not saying that, because there are some tracks that we've already visited that, uh, that do have grip sectors, and it, it becomes more difficult to figure out, okay, which cars are really going to play well here. The, the Toyotas will do well here, the Bentleys will do well here, and the, the Panos will do well here. Um, and, and that is not the same as other tracks where you, f you have at least relative better performance from cars like the Acura and the uh, the Peugeots and the the um, let's say the Ferrari or the BMW um, actually I, I will say that the BMW may have have some decent legs here because it's got it's got enough grip to have uh, early throttle point for the carousel that's turns 9 and 10 here um, and yet still carry enough speed down into turn 12 it's just it just doesn't really have enough power to to reach those super high top speeds. Also, the the wild card for this track is is highest speed attained during qualifying. So it'll be kind of uh, fascinating to see which teams will tweak their tunes in qualifying and then run a slightly different tune during the race. Um, you know, this this track is is going to be extremely low downforce. Um, to try and get those those top speeds here um, so it, the the challenging thing now is with Catrum, Aces Wild, um, Penzoil Zexel and 
Bosch Tech Racing in the Panos and, and Bentleys, who knows who's going to actually be able to uh, achieve pull here. Not in flames with 10% power restriction, though. Uh, that, I think I can I can quite accurately predict that he will not have pull here with a 10% power restriction on a power course. Well, you... Sorry, I was, I was going to say... You say that, but uh, remember Mazda Cup? Um, Alex had a 10% restriction, and yet he still managed pull. So Yeah, whoa. but... Th- it, it is possible. I mean, it's not out of the, the realm of possibility, but it's certainly not my first pick for who's going to get pole here at, at the American GP. You, you know, I I guess my money is probably on, on Bulin. He, he has orchestrated this race. I got to think he's been doing enough planning and um, practice here. And, not, and we're not talking about when a J practice. We're talking about actual laps on the on the track. And, I, you know, I think... He's got something planned here, and uh, of the people um, in in the series at the front, he's probably one of the the most strategic uh, at the front. You know, he's he's got a plan for the rest of the season, and it's all based on how he executes here at the American GP. So, I'm going to predict the Bullen Wall for for pole here at the American GP. I do think he will be closely followed by Alex P and perhaps some others if uh, if they get enough practice in. Five bucks, he gets a wild card, too. Yeah, it's it's very, very likely that uh, Boulinois will get the wild card here uh, with the highest speed attaining qualifying. Heck, he pulled off, like, 200 some, like 204 miles an hour at Sebring with a, like, restriction, so I think he's got this one, the, at least the wild card in the bag. That being said, though, if he does win this, uh, it is an it is kind of an interesting path to the end of the race because we don't have six races left, or um, I'm sorry, we do have six races left. But after this race, we'll only have five races. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, he'll be kind of off kilter a little bit. So he'll have 10% at at uh, Sebring or uh, I'm sorry, Silverstone if he wins this race. So we'll say 10% at Silverstone. 5% at Infineon, assuming he finishes off podium at both of those races. We'll assume he does. We've still got two races left before the finale at Le Mans, which he's also not going to want any power restriction for Le Mans. So the question is, what does he do at Germany or Italy there? Does he try and get second at Nürburgring? Can he get second at Nürburgring with a Bentley? You know, with uh, with people like Senna in the Lola. You know, I think that's going to be really difficult. And the Ferraris are always uh, quite strong at uh, at Nürburgring GP as well. And that is also uh, BTR Blazin's best track. Uh, same could be said for BTR Villanov. You know, he's he's shown that he's got legs at the right tracks as well. So it, it becomes a little cloudy what, what the strategy is here. And honestly, the best setup driver right now is probably in flames. He's got the 10% here at at Road America, although that seems like a huge hit, that means that he'll come back at full power at Infineon if he plays his cards right. If he wins Infineon, he can just ride that out and still end up with 0% restriction at the end. He, In my opinion, that was the best strategy he could have. I don't know if that was in his, uh, you know, his cue cards of what to do at Motegi, but it is really, I think it's going to work out for him if he, if he can execute that strategy. So right now we have pretty much the qualifying been sorted out. The usual suspects will be at the top for this race. We have their strategies somewhat lined out. Steven and Brad, during this race, where are your guys' key corners to get correct and where are your zones to pass? Well, first of all, key corners. Obviously, you want to get the carousel right. That would be turns 9 and 10 because that basically leads you up for the long straight and the kink and usual and you got to get you have to get maximum speed there it's obvious and actually even almost as important as 9 and 10 would be corner 8 you got to carry as much speed as possible through there as well which is one of the things I know Ryan to- taught me actually last year was that you got to be going at least 75 or it was like 70 or 75 through there so make sure when you're qualifying you're going above that speed or at there um, other key corners, I would say, um, 
corner 13, and corner 14, 14, 13 lines up 14, and 14 lines up the long start finish straight, which you also need as much speed as possible. Your thoughts, uh, Stephen? Um, my picks are going to be turn two, because you need to get a good solid run out of that corner to take advantage of that long straight, which, uh, assuming the uh, front straightaway is the longest, but that's it has actually that. turn three. That's that's turn three. Turn Excuse two me. is a little kink Excuse between. Me. Not that straightaway. The 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 so-called kink. Yeah. Anyways, but uh, <laughs> so apologies then. Yes. Turn three, um, going into turn five. Uh, turn five and uh, Canada corner. Turn thirteen. Um, you're gonna see um, those two corners being utilized for, for passing, you're going to see um, the guys that can get the good draft down those long straights and try to late break as much as they can to take advantage of maybe an overtaking opportunity. Um, and of course the last corner as well, you want to get a good run out of that corner so you have the most speed as possible going down the front straight. Something that I do want to uh, add, and um, Somebody who's listening might know who this is targeted to, but please, for the love of God, do not pass on the inside of corner six. It's kind of ludicrous to even pull off a pass into turn six. It's such a, you're going uphill, you're going under a bridge, you go uphill, and the, the braking is all off. So you got to have your line right, even if you're just hot lapping. If you're, if you're taking turn six... Anything off the line, you're way slower. So to even pull off a pass in turn six is really, really difficult and kind of not recommended. Like I back out of anything if I'm if I'm about to overtake in turn six, I'll back out of it and wait for it because turn turn six is really dicey. And if you mess up the exit, you could get overtaken yourself. Into turn six, we saw. Well, I guess we'll we'll just leave them anonymous for now. But into turn six, we saw. Uh, a driver feel that they had <laughs> yes they they had uh, they thought that they were approaching traffic uh, way faster than they were and decided to shoot to the inside of an already too wide into turn six it was going to be tight it looked like it was going to be clean through turn six and then he pulled the pin on the hand grenade and went three wide into turn six and wow it was it was just craziness there were uh, cars spun around it was it was pretty crazy I'll, I'll say that but we haven't had an incident quite like that since um, and and just like he said turn turn six choose your corners wisely turn six is not the overtaking corner from a technological and engineering standpoint if you're just a listener or maybe a driver who is new to the series turn six in any car it was a difficult corner to begin with because you're going uphill as soon as you crest that hill you need to make sure that you have all of your braking almost done before you crest that hill because as soon as you get to the top you lose suspension compression so there's no weight on the tires to slow the car down all you got is the brakes you know somewhat trying to slow the tires down so there's no weight down on the ground trying to stop the car you lose suspension compression and because it's a slow corner, you don't have any aerodynamic advantage. So you pretty much, it's a corner where all the cards are against you. There is no reason that you should, you should try and overtake there. Like Ryan said, even if you think you have a chance, don't go for it. Because from a technological and engineering and physics standpoint, there is no way you're going to be able to make a clean overtake there unless the guy goes super wide into that corner. Because if you dive deep and you lose suspension compression, you're going to have no braking come o coming over the top of that hill. So as soon as the car comes down and fully gets compressed down to the ground, you're already about midway through that apex of that corner. So it's pretty much like Ryan said, pulling the pin on the hand grenade and like holding it out into the group of people going, you know what, I think I'm just going to try a chance here. Do not do it. It is the stupidest thing you could do at this track. It has happened, and the driver knows what he did wrong. Driver X has apologized. He knows what he did. But whatever you do, just do not do it. You see turn six coming, just know, all right, I got to take it easy for this corner because something bad could happen if I get too ballsy. Right, right. So let's let's move on from uh, from Mazda Cup and get back to uh, the R1 American GP. 
I think the overtake positions, I, I couldn't agree more with Brad's analysis of, of what corners uh, to focus on. Uh, absolutely, totally agree with, with every single one he mentioned. I do think that we're going to see a ton of overtaking just after turn 14, uh, down into turn five under braking. You don't really see a whole lot of uh, under braking passing into turn one just because everybody's fighting for that really low uh, there is camber to some of these corners so there's there's kind of only one line to take it at full speed uh, through turn one there and um, turn three in is the, the same carousel. way it, yeah exactly so so typically you don't see a whole lot of overtaking into turn one and turn three but turn five you do see under breaking people taking that inside line and just you know doing a chop uh to make the pass and there's it's it's wide enough the track is wide enough there that you can kind of do it safely you just gotta you really gotta know the track but there is runoff there um you know if you think there's gonna be a collision but uh, turn five i think there's gonna be some passing um and then just after turn 11 just after the kink uh on the back straight is when it'll be realized whether you got a terrible exit out of the carousel or whether you got a wonderful exit out of the carousel. So just after turn 11, between 11 and 12, I think you'll see a lot of passing there. Uh, some people go for uh, passing under braking into turn 12, but that, that is kind of dicey as well it's, as it's the exit slow corner. is loose at the rear. Yeah, uh, heavy braking there uh, into turn 12, hardest braking uh, section of the, uh, of the entire uh, track and then like you said uh, turn 13 14 you mess that up onto that main straight the, the people that get that right uh, they'll be able to pass right around the start finish line um, if uh, if somebody messed up turn 14 so that's that's where I think you're gonna see the most overtaking there so is, is that about it gentlemen is that is that all we got we got for road, for road America for uh, we America? talk about when you want to talk about race predictions? Because we did qualifying. We did no. Race. Yeah, we could go with the race predictions. What do you think, Steven? Who, who's going to win the race? Um, my take is going to be Bullen. Bullen will get pull and you really will think so? win the race. I yeah, I I'm I think he's been he's been uh, planning meticulously the last, last couple of weeks. I'm pretty sure he's got Road America circled on his calendar. Um, I'm going to say the dark horse to win the race is going to be Drake Hellspawn. And I'm going to put that out there because I believe he's actually, my, he's my pick to get that wild card. Because he he knows he's not as fast get, as... Get his own Bullen. wild card. Yeah, get his own <laughs> wild card, exactly. <laughs> of, because you're going to see... Um, you're going to see him using the same setup as Alex, or a very uh, similar setup to Alex during the race. But during qualifying, he's going to be the one that uses the drastic uh, change in setup where that car's got zero downforce, and he's going to do as much uh, work as possible to get as much speed going down turn one as he can, or going into turn one as he can. And then after qualifying's done, even though he won't be as high up as you know he could have been had he used the uh, race setup, he'll use that race setup and he'll just climb through the field. So he's he's my pick for the dark horse, Drake Elspon. So I know we we covered qualifying, but last year, uh, 2012 pole position here was a 143.760, two tenths quicker than BTR Blazon. Um, and, and the time was set by Batman LMP1 in an Acura ARX 02A uh, for wheeling AFD. What do we think is going to happen with that 143.7? Do you think it's going to be smashed? Or do you think that's going to be pretty close to, to the maxing out here? Absolutely and completely smashed. What times are you predicting? Thank you. 42s, Brad? I'm not picking because I was way off last time. I um, I, I don't think you'll see it smashed as bad as Motegi. Um, you'll probably see a low 42 probably as pull. But still I'm not going to make any predictions this week. Cause it, oh, really? Low 42 kind it? of is a smashing, though. 
A low 42 means it's a second and a half or more that the, the poll got destroyed by. So, But I think that prediction is pretty accurate. I think you will see a low 42 for the poll position. What, what's crazy to me is that the time last year was set in a effectively a three gear Acura clutch popping. You know what I mean? And now with with clutches banned, and with detuned transmissions banned, I, th- this like really gets me excited about about qualifying when we do just utterly smash these times. We see these drivers, you know, really hone in and get these cars that shouldn't be capable of these times somehow, uh, you know sprinkling fairy dust on their cars and somehow going you know a 142 or whatever you know it, it's just crazy but that that gets me excited when when you know not that we always have to beat pole position but just seeing that happen um and, and beat the times where perceived advantage items like uh clutch popping or detune transmissions um are beaten and i i think we will see it here i'm gonna go out on a limb and say uh high 141 just saying I'm going out on a limb and saying the high 141. All right, so I think that about does it. And uh, so I guess the next time you'll hear from us, we'll be preparing for the Silverstone uh, race, the British GP. Uh, That's on April 7th. So tune in in two weeks, and we'll have our pre-race podcast for the British GP. Thanks for listening, guys. Nobody remembered about the one on Pepperidge Farm remembers. Stupid radical.